haven't changed in a while. But then when it happens, it'll happen. Okay. Right. <laughs> Please stand with me and open your hymnals to page number 391. 391. I am resolved. 391. All together. If you're resolved, let me hear you. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are hard. Things that are nobler, these have a Lord my son. I will hasten, I will hasten to him, hasten so glad, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Hey, if you're just coming in, get your hymnal and turn the page 391. That's an order. 391. I am resolved on the second. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He has the words of God. I will what? Hasten to him. Hasten so glad. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, Jesus, pray. the third. I am resolved to follow the Savior. Faithful and true he stay. Heed what he's saying. Heed what he's saying. Do what he will. And he is a living way. Hallelujah. I will hasten to him. Hasten so glad. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee on the last. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter it. That's good news right there. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and
that Jeff did not mess up tonight. That's good. <laughs> we got through the whole hymn, and I see people smiling while they're singing, so that's good. Uh, our missionary, Brother T.J. Renee, messaged me this afternoon and said, we love the song service this morning. Every time Jeff would say something, our little one would repeat him. And so, and Jeff would go, holy, their little one would go, holy. <laughs> I thought that was great, and uh, good to see everybody here tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Father, we're so thankful for your goodness to us. We're thankful that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us, and Lord, we're so thankful for that. We pray that if there's someone here tonight that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that tonight... They might clearly understand that. We're thankful for our graduates and pray tonight that you would help them to understand their need to keep surrendered and stay close to thee as they grow. Lord, we ask you to work in our midst tonight, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated and turn in your hymn book to hymn number 411. 411 in your hymn books, The Solid Rock. The Solid Rock 411. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the Solid Rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground. A second when darkness fails his lovely face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground on the third, his hope, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. And all around a storm gives way, my hope. On Christ the solid rock I stand. forth as I last, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground service is coming up. It is going to be a special day, and Brother Dean Bryan will be with us. He was a youth pastor here back in the 70s, and uh, so it'll be a special day. How many of you were in church here when Pastor Bryan was here? Wow, Doc, you're older than I thought you were. <laughs> Kathy, you must have been at the very end of his ministry. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's so good uh, to have him come back, and he was with us just recently, and it was good to see him. His granddaughter is here now, and so we're thankful for that, but you be much in prayer for that, and I hope you'll be a part of that. We are having that meal catered by Country Spice Catering. They've catered things for us in the past, so we'll have sliced roast beef, uh, grilled chicken breast, mashed potatoes, green beans, a garden salad, a fruit salad, some rolls, and some tea, but unfortunately, they are Northern Catering, Catering Company, and the tea will be unsweet. I told them we would double the cost if they would just put a little sugar in that tea, and he said, we don't do that, sir. Yes. No, we're just going to go with about the number we think is going to be here. And if we have more people here than we're prepared for, I will assign some of you not to eat, and that's the way we'll <laughs> No, I think we'll be okay. I think we'll have plenty of food. 
It will be buffet style, but it will be served. And we're doing all this this year to be careful. We don't want anybody, the worst thing in the world would be people to come and somebody get sick with everything we got going on right now. And so that's why we're catering and it'll be served. Normally we just have our ladies fix everything, but you know what? I thought I'll be a hero if our ladies can come and enjoy the day and not have to cook at all. Yeah. See, I mean, that, yeah. what better way can you just become an instant hero? So it'll be a good day and then we'll have a special afternoon service that afternoon. We start that around 1.30 or two and then we're done for the day. And so I hope you'll be with us and be a part of that. It will be a very special day, 19th anniversary of Heritage Baptist Church. And so I hope you'll make plans on being a part of that. All right, Pastor, I'm just telling you right now, I've got two guests already said they're coming. So, well, I just want you to know, I don't want to be left out on the meal. <laughs> I'll tell them to stay home. Right. Now, <laughs> Now, really, seriously, invite people out. It's a good time to invite people out. We'll have plenty of food. Don't worry about it. And uh, uh, my stepdaughter, Roseanne's daughter, and her granddaughter's coming up from Virginia. They'll be with us, and I'm trying to get my son and Michelle to come, and uh, so we have a get-together here. But invite people out, and uh, we'll have food. Don't worry about that. But also remember this. That day is our sacrificial Offering, I mentioned this morning, we only take a special offering usually once a year, and that's our sacrificial Sunday uh, offering on our anniversary Sunday, and uh, we're shooting for the parking lot, and uh, we, it's a large sum, as you can tell from the chart out there, uh, but God can meet that need, and uh, again, I, I just stress, you give what the Lord tells you to give, all right? If he tells you not to give anything, don't give anything. You do what the Lord tells you to do on our sacrificial offering. Um, we mentioned this morning, unfortunately, because of the COVID and all of this, we're not going to have Bible school this year. And also because of the COVID, we're not running our buses here at the church until the schools start their buses. So we're not sure when Michigan's going to open up their schools. We Hopefully it's at the beginning of the school year, but we don't know. So we're just holding off on that also. We will have an activity for the church in the month of August, and uh, more, more details will come with that uh, in the following weeks. But uh, other than that, the deacons meeting, but I'll, I'll speak to the deacons on that. All right, thank you. All right, no sweet tea for the picnic. Uh, the chances of diabetes are low. Because <laughs> that stuff is sweet. Uh, <laughs> in your hymnal, the page number 413, 413, faith is the victory. Encamped along the hills of night, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle where the night shall cool the glory skies against the foes and bells beloved let all our strength be hurled faith is a victory we know that overcomes the world faith is a victory faith is a victory oh glorious victory that overcomes the world now in the second stanza Sing it like you mean it. His banner over us is love. Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with mouths of glory. The faithful which they conquered death is still a shining shield. This last stanza, doesn't that song make you want to just get up and march and just go in the battle? Because, you know, we said we were resolved. Then we said we're on a solid rock. So it must mean that faith is the victory. On the third is our final. And that overcomes the foe. White rain it shall begin. Before the angels he shall know his name. Then come. And hearts of love and flame will vanquish all the host of my hallelujah in whose name? In Jesus.
Jesus, our great name. Come on, saints. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Praise the Lord. We are thankful for all of our graduates this year. I just want to take just a moment to honor them. Uh, Chloe Jones wrote a long thing that she's thankful for. She said, I'm so thankful for my dad. He is the greatest man in the world. I want your Corvette. That's all it says. And uh, so I appreciate, I'm sure she appreciates that. And uh, <laughs> for pastor. That's what I said. <laughs> and, uh, and we want to say congratulations to you. I know homeschooling takes a lot of work and uh, a lot of pressure. And mom and dad need to get that diploma as well. And so we appreciate all the work you did. And so congratulations. And then uh, it's great to also honor Michael McGuire. I, I don't know what I'm going to do in the fall now. The last two years, we've spent it all watching him play football. He was OK. <laughs> and had some good games, had some so-so games. and. I would have been better at I've been a running back instead of an offensive lineman, but you know it is. What, no, he had a great season and a great year, and my kids enjoyed going to the games. I think they enjoyed getting all the candy and treats his grandmother gave them. Uh, but uh, we had a wonderful time, and just want to say congratulations, and uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to get to watch him play. It was a good year, and then Annabelle, of course, had her open house yesterday. They're not here today, family in town, but she graduated as well. And I hope this will be a special time of year for you, but graduating high school is just the beginning. And there's so much life after that. I graduated just a few years ago, and it just seems like yesterday. And, uh, but I graduated high school after some of you were born. So, uh, but uh, we praise the Lord for the opportunities, and thank you so much for being here tonight. And afterwards, we'd like to invite you for some cake and ice cream in the fellowship hall. We'll spend some time just congratulating them on their work. This time we'll have a special, and then we have a special speaker here tonight, Pastor Mark Booth. Uh, his, he, he's, re, he's not retired, he's re, re, retreading, and uh, trying to like, find out what his, what his next line of ministry is. He came to be with us a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't know he had, he had set aside from his church, and uh, uh, we are so thankful that he's able to be here tonight just to make tonight even more special and a faithful minister there in Charlotte for a number of years, and I've been praying for him. Lord would help him to see what his next ministry is. He's been a friend to our church, spoke here before, and I appreciate his ministry and his heart. And we really miss his wife. She used to work at C.J. Banks, and I would go in to purchase stuff for my wife, and she would help me every time. And uh, so they, both of them have been good friends down the years. Thank you so much for being here. We'll have a special night, and Pastor Booth will come and preach for us.
that's ever happened to me. Sorry about that. Praise the Lord for that song and praise the Lord for the singing tonight. It's been a, our hymn book doesn't have that song about faith that we just sang and it was a blessing to hear that again. We remembered that when we were in South Africa. That was in our hymn book. And so praise the Lord for that. It's a wonderful opportunity. I appreciate your pastor inviting me to be here with you. And if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 61. Now, I sure wish before the message your pastor didn't give the whole menu of all that food. Okay? You know, because I wasn't planning on eating till after the service, and now my stomach is saying it's meal time. And so anyway, uh, but we appreciate you folks. Psalm 61. Now, what we're going to look at tonight is a psalm written by David. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced times when you feel desperate. You know, the word desperate means really without hope. And I don't know, maybe I experienced this just recently with all this COVID-19 and all that's going on. My wife and I, when this really kind of erupted, we were uh, in Portugal with our son. There are missionaries there outside of Lisbon where we had been. And there they were, and we heard that nobody was allowed back in the States from Europe. Now, of course, it changed. They said Americans could. But that night, we didn't know. I thought, oh, no. And all we had were carry-ons because our main luggage was in Wales with our daughter. And so anyway, it was like, God, what are we going to do? You know, I mean, we hardly have any clothes. And, and you know, and, but anyway, we were able to finally get back to Wales. And then we called and called. I, I, I spent at least 10 hours with Delta Airlines. And I had like four different flights prepared. And guess what? Finally, we got home. And then, of course, we had to spend the two weeks in quarantine. But we didn't realize when we left to go see our kids overseas that we needed to stock up on toilet paper. <laughs> <coughs> So uh, I don't know how it worked out, but somehow I ordered on Amazon, when I was in Wales, toilet paper. <laughs> and it was supposed to arrive April 21st, but it got there a day before we arrived at the end of March. Praise the Lord. Amazon was quick that time. <laughs> so we were able to survive COVID, and we were able to have all the toilet paper we needed. <clears throat> but you know, seriously, all of us, even during this time of COVID, I'm sure you have felt at times hopeless. Like, what is going on? What's my future going to be like? I really sympathize. You know, when I go to these towns and I see all their seniors and their pictures up on wherever, and I'm thinking, wow, th they didn't have their graduation. They didn't have all the different activities that are affiliated with graduation. And, uh, you know, I kind of felt for them. But then I, I feel for so many other people. You know, all the little small businesses in Charlotte and how they had to close down and what's going to happen. In other words, uh, these times seem pretty desperate. Uh, our nation seems to be in desperate times. Uh, our churches, seriously, are in desperate times. And our families are facing desperate times. A matter of fact, Psalm 61 comes about because David's family is a mess. And Absalom, his son, I don't have time to go through the, the reason why, but Absalom, David's son, has rebelled against David. He has taken over the kingdom. David has fled from Jerusalem. His life is in danger from his very own son. Now, try to let that sink in. I mean, I've heard of children just kind of walking away from their parents. I've heard of parents denying their children. But to imagine one's son who is out to kill his father and has taken over his kingdom. 
Can you just imagine the situation that David's in? Can you imagine how desperate he must be? Now, maybe none of us have experienced that. I doubt it. But there have been times in our life, maybe a health issue, a family issue, a financial issue, where you and I have felt desperate. And God seems so very distant. You know, there was a story told of a young boy, and his <coughs> father was in the military. And so every night the boy was comforted because, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I was scared to death of the dark. We had to have a night-night light on for me. And every night he, before he would go to sleep, he'd look at that picture of his dad because his dad was away. He was in the military. And, and so every night he found comfort looking at that picture. Even when he was afraid, he'd look at that picture and say, my daddy loves me, my daddy cares about me. But guess what happened? One day, he started crying and crying and crying, and his mom came in, and she said, well, your daddy's picture's right there. And he said, oh, if only he could come out of the frame and be with me. And you know, I think that happens to us sometimes, doesn't it? It seems like we know God loves us. We know that he is real, just like this boy's father, but he seems so far away. And that's where David was here in Psalm 61. So let's read it, and then we're going to get into this prayer of a desperate man. What does it mean? How does David express himself in a time of probably the greatest trial in his life? Well, let's look at verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. You can get the desperation right there, but we'll go continue. From the end of the earth <clears throat> will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life. You see the hope now. It starts off with desperation, and he says, you will prolong my life. And his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Let's pray. Father, we live in desperate times. Not only with this disease that's going around, but all sorts of turmoil within our nation, but also this turmoil in our hearts. Sometimes you seem so far away. We, circumstances and the trials of life seem so much larger than you. We know you're there. We know you love us. But yet, just like that little boy, it seems like we just want you to come out of that, that frame and just hug us and draw us close to you. And so I pray that you will use this message in our hearts to bring encouragement, to bring conviction, to bring comfort, and to bring strength. So we thank you for your word tonight and guide us as we look at it. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. Well, Psalm 61 is David's prayer. Now, if it were you or me and you were running away from your son, you were running for your life, I think the first thing we would think about is praying. You know, there's times when we really do want to pray. You know, we don't have to hear a message about how we should pray, how we need to pray. There are times in your life and mine that nobody has to try to tell us to pray. We do it. And that's where David is right now. In verse number one, we see David's earnestness in prayer, his desperate prayer. Notice how earnest he is. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. 
Listen to me, God. Hear my cry. He says in Psalm 34, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. You see, David is in a desperate situation, as I already mentioned. And his only response was to cry out to God. He's a desperate man who is now resorted to a desperate measure. You know, one of the things that, <clears throat> I don't know, I could be wrong in this, but it seems like every other event that's happened in our history, it seems like people are drawn more to God. You know, I look at what happened in September 11th. It didn't last for long, but people seem to be drawn closer to God. I mean, when you see all of Congress singing, God bless America, you know, you know there must be something happening temporarily. But with this uh, situation, it seems like people have turned further from God. It's so easy to do because we're no longer coming to church, especially for a couple of months, two or three months. And I know people are watching things online, but it's not the same. And I think for many of us, it's been a struggle to retain that relationship with the Lord. And I don't think, I hope, I'm, not, I'm wrong, but it seems like we as Christians have lost that desperate cry unto God. And here, David is in a desperate situation. And I believe our churches are in a desperate situation. I'm putting aside the United States of America. I'm talking about our churches. Because this is not only happening here, it's around the world. I know my son-in-law and daughter in Wales, they still cannot meet in church. And the struggle that that is, not only for their church, but for other churches there in Wales and, and my son in Portugal and, and all around the world. I mean, the Renees, I'm sure things are different there than it was before in Belarus. And so when we think of these things, we need to get back to real earnestness in our prayers. You know, we're too often just praying rote prayers. But here is David, and he's pouring out his heart, and he's crying out to God. He's earnest in his prayer because he's desperate. Maybe the situation that you and I are facing today, God has allowed so that his people would become desperate in their prayers, that they would become earnest, as David says here, he's so earnest. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. When I look at that word, hear my cry, it's almost like a baby that's desperate for food. Now, I, I, my, my wife always got up for the babies, not me. But she understood that cry, the desperate cries of the babies when they're crying out for food. Oh, God is pointing out through this psalm that only if his people would cry like a desperate baby in the middle of the night. Because for many of us, it is the middle of the night. For many of us, it is a desperate situation. And so we see the earnestness of his prayer. And then notice where he prays. Now, he's no longer by the tabernacle. He's no longer where all the priests are. He's no longer in Jerusalem, the city of God. He's out in the wilderness. He's fleeing from his son. And notice what he says here. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. Notice, David is far from home. But he knows that God is there. You know, isn't it amazing how God is everywhere? We know he is. That's a technical term, omnipresence of God. God is everywhere. <coughs> He's here. He's with the Renes over in Belarus. He's with your missionaries if you have them in Brazil. He's with my children in Portugal. God is everywhere. <coughs> and he is there for you and me to hear your prayer. 
Yes, church is a great place to pray, but your car is a great place to pray. Walking down the street is a great place to pray. In your home is a great place to pray. Where you are at work, it's a great place to pray. In other words, David understood that prayer was not limited to Jerusalem. He understood that there he was, fleeing from his son, and that prayer can be done anywhere. The place of prayer is where you are. There's no special place. Yes, it's wonderful when God's people get together and pray together. We're supposed to. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But anywhere you are, any time is the place of prayer. And you and I, when we get desperate, sometimes we forget that God is right there with us. Sometimes we get so angry at situations, we forget God. Sometimes we get so worried about situations, we forget God. Sometimes we are so uh, anxious that we forget God. But God's there. He's here. And David understood that. He could have felt, well, I'm not going to pray. I'm out of Jerusalem. Until I get back. I'm, no, he didn't. He prayed. But notice something else here. Notice when he prayed. He said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, I can just picture that, when my heart is overwhelmed. I remember one time uh, I went to uh, Honduras to visit one of our missionaries. And he took us, and there were some other people in our church, we were a group that went there to Honduras, he took us to this waterfalls. And the idea was that you were supposed to go under the waterfalls with this tour. Well, as I got closer and closer to these waterfalls, you know, it's just like the water was everywhere. And I hated swimming when I was growing up. I was scared. I was panicking. And, and I just said, I can't go any further. I could hardly even breathe. You know, I don't know how it was, but I couldn't breathe. I was overwhelmed. Those falls had, waterfalls had conquered me. They had won the victory. What has won the victory over you? What has overwhelmed you? You see, David understood that he was overwhelmed. When my heart is overwhelmed, when my heart is like wave after wave of bad news, <clears throat> wave after wave of pain, wave after wave of rejection. He's drowning. See, that's when we need to come to God. Too often Christians run away from God in the very time they need him the most. Have you done that? Don't think about somebody else. Think about your own life. Oh, you may sit in this church. You may sing the songs, faith is the victory. But do we really believe it? Is it really real? See, when our hearts are overwhelmed, we can only go one place. And that's to the Lord. That's why he says here, when my heart is overwhelmed, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Hey, if you're drowning, you're not going to look for a rock that's sitting in, you know, way deep in the ocean. You're going to look for a rock that's higher than you are so you can get a hold of that rock and be safe. And that's what he did. So here's this desperate man. What does he do? He's earnest in his prayer. He knows that wherever he is, he can pray. He knows that when his heart is overwhelmed, he needs to go to the rock that is higher than him. And that leads me to our attitude. What is your attitude when you go before God? Is it an attitude of, oh yeah, here I am, I have to do my prayer thing? Is it an attitude of just like, 
just keep saying everything by rote. Notice his attitude here is humility. I want to go to the rock that is higher than me. You see his humility? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. You know, David could have been a bitter man right now. Remember, his son has rebelled against him. He's out of his kingdom. Remember, Shemai at that time, as he was leaving Jerusalem, mocked him. He felt alone. He felt desperate. And you know, that's when people oftentimes get angry with God. They get angry with God the very time they should turn to him. They get angry with God the very time they should turn to him. And here, David says in all humility, I need to go to the rock that's higher than me. As the songwriter wrote, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Do you see his humility? A broken and contrite heart, O oh Lord, thou will not despise. If you're in a desperate situation, if your heart is hurting, if you feel confused about the future, then go to him in humility. But notice how he goes to him, not only in humility, but he goes back and he shows his faith for in the past, in verse 3, he's saying, <clears throat> For thou hast been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. He says, not only is he humble in his prayer, but he's filled with faith. He says, I remember in the past <clears throat> when you have been that shelter for me. Now, a shelter is some place you run. I don't know if you remember this, but when I was a kid, uh, there were certain homes that had a hand on the window like a drawing of a hand. <laughs> and the idea was that that was a safe place. You know, if somebody wanted to kidnap you, I don't think anybody would want me, but anyway, if someone wanted to kidnap you or hurt you, you were to run to that house and there was that hand <coughs> and somebody was supposed to be there to take care of you. It was a safe house. Well, that's exactly what David said God is. When we are facing the hurts, the confusion of life, he says, not only are you a rock that's higher than me, but you're my safe place. You're the place that I can run to. Are you running to God? Don't run away from God, but run to his arms. And that's what David is saying here. This is a miracle, this psalm. He has every reason... <coughs> to be in despair. He has every reason to quit. He has every reason to walk out on God. But instead he turns to God. And he says, you're my safe place. You're the rock that's higher, higher than mine. And he says, you're my strong tower. That's a place of great protection and strength. When I am weak, then I am strong. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And so here is David. He's coming to God with all humility. He's coming to God with faith. And then notice in verse number four, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. Now, he wasn't anywhere near the tabernacle. I mean, he, he, he may, in his mind, he may never see the tabernacle again. But he says, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. <clears throat> What's he saying? I am always in your presence. In desperate times, not only do we need to know that God's a rock higher than I, not only do we need to know that he's the safe place, not only do we need to know that he's the strong tower, but we need to remember that he is the ever-present God. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. No matter what you're going through today, God is not going to abandon you. No matter what you're going through today, God is going to walk with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Please, don't forget the presence of God. I would hope that we as Christians understand that, yes, what's going on is real, this disease is real, but we still need to look at this from a perspective that's different than the world. People without Christ, I don't care whether they're a young person or an older person, this is their only life. That's why this is such a drastic thing that's going on today. But for us, this is just a prelude to being with our Heavenly Father forever and ever and ever, this earth. We are only pilgrims. But aren't you glad that in this pilgrimage, we're not alone? No matter the trials or the tribulations, he is with us. And all through scripture, we see God with his people. And so David says, I know you are with me. No matter how desperate the time is, you are with me. And he says, because of that, I'm going to trust you. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. You know, it was really a beautiful thing that we had in our lives just a couple months ago. We had a visitor right outside our bathroom window, a robin. And this robin had built a beautiful nest. I mean, I could reach out and touch it if it wasn't the window between us. <clears throat> and this robin laid one egg, two eggs, three eggs, and that was it. And that robin would just sit on those eggs. I mean, you'd see her there just, you know, incubating those eggs. And then one day we looked out and one of the eggs hatched. Then the next egg hatched, and the next egg hatched. And she hovered around those little birds, their little babies, with great affection. She would go and feed those little birds until the birds were ready to fly off. Now, if a robin will take care of their babies that way, why do we have so much trouble thinking our Heavenly Father will take care of us? See, that's what David was saying here. This is the worst time of my life, he's probably thinking. But you know what? I'm still going to trust you. I'm going to trust in the protection of your wings. See, <clears throat> even in times of desperation, God's still going to protect you. I once heard this statement, and it's always helped me that nothing enters into my life that doesn't first pass through the hands of a loving God. And let me add, an all-wise and all-powerful God as well. He's there. And David understood that. See, you and I face desperate times. And you and I know that it's, it's difficult. But David gave himself to the Lord. He prayed with earnestness. He prayed with faith. He prayed with humility. And then notice his confidence in verse 5. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. He says, you've heard me. You've heard what I have said. God hears you. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I don't know, I thought progress meant things were easier. But I'll tell you what, if you ever try to call a company, it's not easier. You call and you get, 
First of all, hit one if you in English, hit two if you're Spanish. <coughs> and then they give you all these options, and then they give you this, and then they ask for your number, and then you might get somebody maybe 20, 30 minutes later. And it's like, you know, it, it's amazing. And then also, remember, I mean, in my day, you didn't know who called you when the phone rang. You know, there was no caller ID. Well, it's still my day, I'm still alive, but when I was a kid. And uh, you would answer the phone. But today, it's like you see the caller ID, and it may even be somebody you know, and you say, uh, I don't think I want to talk to them today. <laughs> Aren't you glad God doesn't treat us like that in our prayers? Aren't you glad that God doesn't have call waiting? Aren't you glad that God does have caller ID, but he doesn't select his calls? And that's what David said. He said, I know you've heard me, Lord. I have that confidence. And you know what? I know that you're still going to use me in the lives of others. Not only do you hear me in my desperation, but notice you've given me a heritage <coughs> of those that fear thy name. He has a heritage. You and I are the beneficiaries of that heritage today. We're reading his psalm today. We're the beneficiaries of David's heart. We're the beneficiaries of David's praising God. We're the beneficiaries of David's confession of sin as seen in Psalm 51. And David says, I know you hear my prayer and you have given me a heritage. What heritage are you going to have? You know, if you're a young person, what, what, what heritage or influence are you going to have on others? Are you going to leave an imprint for God? Really, that's what lasts for eternity. There's no other imprint. Are you going to leave an imprint for God? Parents, are you going to leave an imprint on your children for God? Grandparents, are you going to leave an imprint upon your grandchildren for God? This church, are you going to leave an imprint upon this community for God and through missions around the world? See, that's what David had confidence. Because in his desperation, he went to God. He didn't run away from God. Your life is filled with trials and tribulation, yes. But those trials and tribulations should turn you and me to God and should cause us to cry out to him and let him have his way in our life. And he will preserve us. And I, I, with time, I'm going to close with verse 8. Notice the psalm begins with a cry, and it ends in verse 8 with praise. So will I sing unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Notice in verse 1, hear my cry, O God. And then in verse 8, he says, hear my praise. Now, Notice, is David back in Jerusalem yet? No. Is David still fleeing from his son? Yes. Does his situation still look hopeless, humanly speaking? Yes. But David, because he cried out to God, his cry became praise. The greatest praise doesn't come from blessing. The greatest praise comes from heartaches that turn those heartaches to God and let him triumph over the heartache for his glory. And that is exactly <coughs> what David did. You know, I am so grateful for the word of God. You know, I was talking to a young man earlier tonight <coughs> And he said he was going, he wanted to go to Olivet College. And uh, I actually graduated from Olivet College just a few years ago. <coughs> <laughs> 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 
Well, more than that, I don't want to be a liar, then you won't listen to what I have. <laughs> but anyway, when I went to Olivet College, actually I went to Olivet College because I wanted to get away from the city. I was raised in the inner city, Highland Park, Michigan, and that's where I was raised. And I just wanted to get out in the country, and there's, there's not a nicer campus, I think, in anywhere than Olivet. It's just a beautiful campus. I didn't know the Lord is my savior. So in my desperate times as a young person, I had nowhere to turn. I didn't have that deep relationship with my father. Uh, my mother was kind of not always, she kind of let me do as I please, let's put it that way. I mean, I'd ride my bike across the Ambassador Bridge, you could do that in those days, to Canada, and she didn't know where I was. You know, that'd be 12, 15 miles away. I'd ride my bike to Bell Isle. Where have you been today? Oh, I've been at Ford Park, Mom. <coughs> but anyway, uh, I, I was lost. But I went to a church that didn't, didn't preach the gospel. But I wanted to be a pastor because I always liked what our pastor did because he smoked a pipe and he gave a 15-minute message once a week. <laughs> and so I went to our denominational school, which was Olivet College. And there was there a young man who wanted to go to Bob Jones. Uh, but his dad made him go to Olivet College because he had a football scholarship. <clears throat> and so he made him go to Olivet. But while he was there, I was in his dorm, his floor. He was an, a student advisor. And through his testimony, he took me to church, where I was pastor, actually, Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, actually, I remember Judy as uh, she was living in Charlotte, and I was a college student. So I don't know if that makes her older or younger. <laughs> you figure that out. But anyway, uh, I, was, I started going to church, and I asked the Lord to be my Savior. And from that time, yes, there have been desperate times. <clears throat> I mean, being in South Africa, there was a lot of desperate times. Being in Portugal, there were some desperate times. We all faced them. But... Because I had asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior when I was 19 years old, I had someone to turn to. And tonight, maybe you're like me. You, 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 I believed in God. I believed in, you know, I had that photo like that kid did, you know, of his father. I, I believed that there was a God. I believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross, but I didn't know why. I believed that he rose from the grave, but I had never put my faith in him as Lord and Savior. I was never taught that. And so my life, I made dumb decisions. Well, I still make some dumb decisions, but I made decisions without Christ. I had to face life my first 19 years pretty much like a ship with no rudder. But I thank the Lord that I accepted him as my Lord and Savior by his grace. And if you don't know the Lord is your Savior, this whole prayer is not for you yet. Yes, you can cry out and be saved. That prayer is for you. I need you, Lord, as Savior. I repent of my sin. And so if you don't know him, just like I didn't as a college student at Olivet College, but I'm thankful that through the desperate times, as his child, my father is there. My heavenly father hears my cries. My heavenly father is there when I come to him in all humility and faith. My heavenly father has given me a heritage. And for those of us that are Christians tonight, I know these times aren't easy. I mean, when I resigned the church, it was last June, and then it ended up being, I left in the end of May, just no, oh, almost a year later. But we wanted to spend more time with our family overseas, and look, we can't go overseas. So we don't always understand the ways of God. But we know the greatness of God. 
We know that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so no matter how desperate <coughs> your time, your things, the things that are happening to you, please, don't walk away from God. Walk to him. Cry to him. David cried to him, and his cry became praise. And God did work it out that he got back to Jerusalem. But the point is, he didn't know that at this time. But his cry still became praise. May this time of confusion, this time of anxiety and worry, may it cause you and me to cry out to God. May this time of confusion cause us to trust in him. May this time of all these anxious things, the news media just creates all sorts of anxiety, may it help you and I realize that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And may your cry become praise. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, he's ready to hear your cry of repentance, to come to him and believe her He's there. He's your father. My father was always hard of hearing. He'd have to shout. That's why I have such a big mouth. But you know what? Our heavenly father is not hard of hearing. And he's always available. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our dear father, <clears throat> we thank you for the truth of Psalm 61. We thank you for the example of David. Yes, he did some things wrong in that whole circumstance, but yet we can't imagine how crushed he must have been. His own son rebelling, his own son seeking his life, and yet he stopped, he cried out to you, and you answered. And I do pray that you would help us to do that. Help us to know that truly when you, are, when you seem far away, you're right there with us. And I do pray if there's anybody here that was like me when I was a, a college student at Olivet, that they would see their need to accept you as their Lord and Savior. So we thank you for this dear church. May you take them from strength to strength. May you use this church and this community and around the world. And may you help that through these very challenging and trying times, that they would keep their eyes on you, knowing that you are a great and mighty God. In Jesus' most